In a recent video, we learned about kekulein, the chat version of benzene. If this molecule already surprised you, boy, do I have something in store for you. Today, we will learn about an insane supramolecular structure, as crazy as it sounds, created with help of simple scotch tape which not only makes the mighty Kakulein look like peanuts, but could also be used in protecting spacecraft during interplanetary travel. Unfortunately, we will need to induce some physical chemistry flashbacks, so I'm happy I can count on your company for comfort. Today's video will cover some advanced science, but we will also learn some simple trivia that will be insightful for everyone. For example, why a 100 degree hot sauna does not burn you as much as boiling water, or why diamonds conduct heat, but not electricity. Also, we will see why Slavic rocks rock. So you've probably heard that graphite is made out of carbon, but diamonds are also made out of carbon. How does this work? Carbon is a unique element due to its ability to form four bonds, meaning it can organize itself in multiple structural different forms. These so-called allotropes can show completely different properties. On one hand, diamonds are one of the hardest known natural minerals. This is due to the very compact and rigid tetrahedral configuration of sp3 hybridized atoms in the lattice. On the other hand, graphite, another natural carbon allotrope, is basically connected benzene sheets characterized by sp2 hybridization, which allows for lateral overlap of the p orbitals within each sheet, but not across the sheets. This creates delocalized electrons which can transport electrical charge. In comparison, the tetrahedral diamond structure does not allow this electrical conductivity. But diamonds actually have incredibly high thermal conductivity. How is this possible? We'll talk more about this later. Before we continue, I opened a channel membership option on YouTube and Patreon. Check it out if you would like to support. I thought it could be cool and insightful to share some more regular deep dives on interesting chemistry topics with some of you. Appreciate any support to make the immense time I waste on these videos just a bit more rewarding. So there are also non-natural allotropes of carbon, such as fullerenes, basically huge soccer balls made out of carbons as well as other carbon-based geometries like spheres or nanotubes. The C60 fullerene, also called Buckminster fullerene, is the most famous one of this class and forms beautiful black crystals. You might remember two parameters that we discussed with Kekulein, superaromaticity and solubility. Like Kekulein, C60 is not super aromatic, so the pi electrons in the individual rings are not delocalized over the whole ball. Also, like we saw with Kekulein, this very apolar carbon blob is only soluble in very similarly apolar solvents, which is why there are also investigations into polar functionalized fullerenes that could be applied more broadly. Interestingly, solutions of C60 are often a beautiful pinkish purple. There are different ways to get fullerenes, and as you can imagine, they are very elusive and exotic. The most widespread is electric arc discharge, which is based on some ionization wizardry between graphite electrodes. The second one is laser ablation, where graphite is being successively fired at with lasers, leading to vaporization of carbon and formation of fullerenes after deposition of these carbons at a downstream collector. The third one is painful bottom-up organic synthesis, where polycyclic aromatic compounds are built up and then either pyrolyzed at blistering hot temperatures or also shot at with lasers. Fullerenes can be formed by either bottom-up combination of carbon clusters and fragments or top-down folding of a really big sheet. There are various mechanisms and routes that are postulated and the key takeaway here is that the formation pathway is really dependent on how big the final fullerene actually is. For example, investigation of the direct top-down transformation of a graphene sheet to fullerene showed that there is a sweet spot for formation of fullerenes that are around 60 to 100 carbons big in size. This fact can be rationalized by looking at the potential energy penalty in the step D on this diagram, which is curving of a remodeled graphene. If the flake is larger than several hundreds of carbons, the strong van der Waals forces will prevent the curving. On the other hand, a high strain energy suppresses fullerenes which are smaller than 60 carbons. Contrary to what you might think based on these exotic methods, research from over 30 years ago already indicated that C60 and C70 fullerenes can form in natural geology. 
The learning is you can never underestimate rocks, especially not Slavic ones. As someone pointed out in a comment, there is even the naturally occurring carpophyte mineral, first discovered in Ukraine but also found in California and elsewhere. It's made of exceptionally pure coronine, once part of dead fishies, another oceanic sediment, which was purified and concentrated into some random rocks. Absolutely crazy stuff. Fullerenes provide platforms to investigate different supramolecular interactions or functionalities, such as ion sensing. Also, there's some funny stuff like molecular surgery. This could be a nice topic for future videos, so if you're interested in this, let me know in the comments. So wait a second. If we're not talking about normal fullerene, what is this video about then? Is there anything that outscales fullerenes in the same way like kekulin? The answer seems just ridiculous, but hear me out. Imagine taking fullerenes and organizing them in a graphene-like sheet to create graphfullerene. While this might look like an imaginary material, scientists recently created it and discovered some intriguing properties. But the first question is, how would you even get to such connected fullerene balls? The answer is called chemical vapor transport. The first step is pressing C60 fullerene and magnesium powder into a solid pellet, sealing it in a fused tube under vacuum and placing it into a furnace with a temperature gradient. Under an inert gas flow, vaporization of fullerene and slow cooling formed single crystals of fullerene polymers containing magnesium ions. This is a very experimental process, requiring a lot of optimization to get to the sweet spot of large crystals that are homogeneous, have few defects and are also easy to handle. Also, magnesium can even react with quartz at high temperatures. The random nature of CVT is nicely illustrated by this observation. While the team found a ratio of 4 magnesium atoms per fullerene under their established conditions, this ratio changed to 2 magnesium per fullerene when they used simply just a finer magnesium powder in the pellet without altering any other conditions. Looking at the structure of these crystals revealed new intermolecular bonds between fullerenes based on 2 plus 2 like addition and additional CC bonds. The closest CC distance between two balls is around 2.6 angstrom, which is roughly half of the distance you can find in monomeric fullerene crystals. This clearly proves the direct covalent bonding between the individual balls. The magnesium is a key ingredient needed to facilitate the polymerization. The crystal structure shows that magnesium ions are closely associated within each individual graphfullerene layer and not shared between them. This means the bonding between layers is quite weak, predominantly based on van der Waals interactions. So we have a graphene-like situation where there is strong intra-sheet but low inter-sheet connectivity. If you have the software, the publication also contains the crystal structure file which you can explore to get the 3D feel. So now we have half a millimeter wide crystals with many many layers. But just a few layers creating a 2D material would actually be much more useful for application in electronic devices or quantum materials due to two main reasons. First, single atomic layers can show electromagnetic and optical properties that are very different from the 3D material. If you take just two or three individual layers and stack or twist them in specific ways, so-called moiré systems can form. As you see in the right-hand chart, freaky materials and phenomena arise through engineering of such layered systems. I won't pretend like I know why this helps the simulation of Hubbard physics, but the idea is that few layer 2D materials are quite cool. As a second benefit, the exfoliation to just few layers would give very clean surfaces without contaminants. You can imagine it like peeling off layers of an onion, revealing super fresh stuff inside. To this end, they first wanted to remove the magnesium from the polymer lattice to make the exfoliation easier. This is the only wet chemistry we will see today and it's quite straightforward. By simply soaking crystals in aqueous acidic solution, the scientists were able to wash out the magnesium ions. They found that using acetic or nitric acid leaches it out the most, maybe due to the chelate counter ions that bind magnesium more strongly than chloride in HCl for example. The first removal step was incomplete, so they subsequently cooked things a bit in hot NMP to fully remove magnesium, as evident from X-ray analysis here on the right hand side. If you're wondering why there's an oxygen peak in the before analysis, it's coming from oxidized magnesium species and not the C60 layers themselves. 
you can see that the graphullerite crystals themselves are still intact. To validate this, they also looked at Raman spectroscopy. Indeed, the two greenish colored before versus after spectra did not look significantly different, so magnesium removal had no impact. These spectra also indicated that this is actually a polymer due to the missing AG2 pentagonal pinch mode. This signal, indicated by the purple line, would be quite characteristic for molecular C60 monomers as you can see in this reference chart. This missing or shifted signal is due to symmetry and molecular orbital changes from the new covalent fullerene bridges. They now had a purely carbon-based C60 graphullerite material. And if you remember, they did not see any interlayer CC covalent bonds. This means the next logical step was to separate or exfoliate the crystal layers. This can be literally done with sticky scotch tape and reliably gave very thin flakes consisting of only two graphullerene layers. Here you can see the optical micrograph, so basically a picture taken with a microscope, and the atomic force microscopy image, AFM, of the bilayer in the red rectangle. The bilayer turns out to be roughly 2.4 nanometers thick. Oh, and by the way, feel free to pause the video in the coming minutes to digest the pictures and content without pressure. Amping up the resolution even more, they turn to the highly sensitive transmission electron microscopy, which basically uses electron beams to take pictures. The magnified inset here shows very bright spheres which correspond to the C60 subunits arranged in a hexagonal lattice. To remove noise, they applied an inverse Fourier transform filter which gave this money shot. Here you can clearly see that each C60 ball is connected to six other fullerenes in a molecular plane. The last image looks like it will give you a headache if you stare at it for too long. It's also a really interesting one as it shows there are variations of the periodic structures between the two graphullerene layers, reminiscent of the superstructures we briefly touched on earlier. There actually was another effort earlier in 2022 which obtained single monolayers of graphullerene, but these were ionic species based on tetrabutyl ammonium cations and reduced C60 anions. Charge sheets and presence of counter ions hinders the applicability of these structures for optoelectronic devices and next generation structures. That piece of research showed that the C60 fullerene anions could be oxidized back by using hydrogen peroxide and thus gave an indirect access to these neutral lattices. However, this chemical step might also lead to additional residual impurities in your product. So the publication we're talking about is differentiated by the fact that it gives charge neutral graph fullerene sheets in a simpler and cleaner manner, but it also comes at the cost of giving bilayers and not single layers. So this material is undoubtedly awesome, but how does it behave? One of the key optoelectronic properties is photoluminescence, which looks at light emission after a compound has absorbed electromagnetic radiation in form of photons. Here we see some key differences compared to C60. First, the spectrum is blue shifted towards higher energies and lower wavelengths, something that is apparently commonly seen with 2D materials. The next insight is more interesting, but unfortunately it required me to recall some of that sweet physical chemistry trauma. You see, the polymers have very high photoabsorption at just over 1.8 electron volts, which is not seen at all in normal C60, indicated by the dotted purple circle. This is roughly the energy of the band gap transition between the two electronic states at ground vibrational levels. And if I can trust the energy diagram of fullerene from Wikipedia, this would be a transition between two states which both have uneven parity molecular orbitals because normal C60 has an inversion center and is centrosymmetric, such a conserved parity transition is forbidden. And that's why normal C60 does not absorb any photons at this energy and has no photoluminescence intensity. In graph fullerene, however, the covalent polymerization changes this electronic structure, now allowing the previously forbidden transition. We can again see the utility of charged neutral graph fullerene, as they found that presence of magnesium counter ions was detrimental to the material's optical properties. As they previously observed the moiré-like variations in the graph fullerene IFFT picture we talked about, they wanted to see if these superstructures had any effect on photoluminescence as well. 
With the very cool near-field nano photoluminescence technique, they were able to look for local differences in luminescence across a single flake. The brighter the spots, the higher the cumulative luminescence intensity over the photon emission range of 700 to 900 nanometers. You can see that the brightness is changing on a roughly around 50 nanometer scale. So there are different domains with different photoelectronic behavior originating from the superstructure. Even though the team did not manipulate the flake or the graphfullerene layers, this behavior suggests that twisted structures with fancy properties might be engineerable. They further showed that they had their hands on some really good stuff by observing systematic oscillations in near-field microscopy signals. I will explain it in layman's terms and really couldn't bother trying to understand what this tip-tapping frequency is about, kinda sounds like a dance. These oscillations, which you can see by the shifting S5 amplitude in the pictures, are coming from wave interferences within the crystal itself. This wave travel and the resulting oscillations can only happen if the material has low defects or impurities, allowing the waves to zoom around in an uninterrupted manner. You can think of impurities being obstacles to a car racing on a highway. Lastly, they looked at thermal conductivity, finally a measurement we all know, basically the rate of heat flow. There's an important distinction of temperature, which is based on the average kinetic energy of molecules in an object, and heat, which is the thermal energy transferred due to a difference in temperature between objects or media. This means that 100 degree hot air in a sauna and 100 degree hot boiling water have the same temperature, but different thermal energy stored and available for transport. Thermal transport in water is over a magnitude higher compared to air largely driven by the higher molecular density in water compared to gas phase. Obviously, if there are fewer molecules around, transfer of energy becomes more challenging. Heat transfer works differently in different states. In the gas or liquid aggregate state, for example just covered, it's based on collision of molecules. However, in metals, thermal energy can be carried by electrons. Silver has a very high K value based on its electron configuration with a free S-shell electron. Similar to what we've already saw in the microscopy tip-tapping oscillations, the less pure the matrix, the worse the thermal conductivity gets, back to the highway analogy. In lattices or crystals, heat transport goes via lattice vibrations, which are governed by quasi-particles called phonons. Photons are quantized light particles. Phonons, on the other hand, are quantized vibrational motions of atom lattices. It's kind of like a wobbly, collectively vibrating building structure. This is a field that most students thankfully do not have to learn about, as it also invokes freaky exotic theories like phonon tunneling. The stats for diamond and graphene are very impressive. Both of them showing a very high thermal conductivity due to long average phonon paths and low scattering. Even carbon isotopes can function as impurities and lattices, as isotope purified diamonds have even 50% higher K values. Graphene is similarly impressive, and here we again see that conductivity is only strong within each plane and not across individual sheets. Because these phonons create a unique and distinct pathway, we have the situation where diamonds can transport heat very well, even they do not transport charge or free electrons. So what about the thermal transport in graphfullerene? With a K value of around 2.7, graphfullerene is roughly 10 times more conductive compared to molecular C60. It makes absolute sense, obviously. Intermolecularly connected fullerenes can conduct heat better than non-bonded balls. The scientists went a step further and simulated how this average K value could break down across the crystal dimensions. As you would expect, the in-plane transport along the B-axis here, so the interfullerene bonds, is expected to be the highest. Whether this modest thermal conductivity will actually be useful for protective coatings of spacecraft, I'm not so sure. But overall, graphfullerene's material quality, properties and potential superlattice structure definitely make it a promising material for further optical and electronic investigations. Also, there are other variants imaginable with different types of bonds between the fullerenes, and all of these could have different properties. As always, there is a lot of research, investment and time required to develop, mature and actually operationalize novel materials in the real world. That's it for today. I hope you learned a new thing or two about physics and chemistry and hope to see you in the next one. 
Thanks for showing your support by subscribing to the channel or even joining as a YouTube or Patreon member. Thanks and until next time.